This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now, I am just so fucking excited for today's show because I will be talking to the super cute, super talented Krista Erickson. You all remember her? She played the nast the nasty girl in Little Darlings, the 1980 cult classic, starring Christy McNichol and Tatum O'Neill. She then uh, worked her way to starring roles in movies like The First Time, Jekyll and Hyde Together Again. Um, she was in Deadly Lessons with my good friend Diane Franklin and Dina Freeman, and she guest starred on lots of great TV shows. Um, Fame, uh, The New Gidget with my friend Karen Richman. Um, of course, uh, she replaced Donna Wilkes on Hello, Larry. And then she became a journalist and got out of acting. And we're going to be talking about all of that stuff today. And I am just super excited. Um, it's been a while coming. I've been waiting for this interview. And I am just so excited because she's an icon of my childhood. And... It's going to be spectacular. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Krista Erickson. Good morning, Krista. Welcome to the show. How are you today? How are you? I am. Um... So, uh, sorry, <laughs> I don't. I think my phone is like not ringing. I, I gotta figure out. I I hate Apple. I'm sorry. I, I just don't <laughs> like iPhones. Yeah, I don't either. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it just went, like, straight to voicemail. I know. I know, and I can't, I'm like, I went to the settings, I went to notifications, I'm like, yep, sound is on, phone is on. Yeah, I, I looked at everything. Yeah, since I would, what you would normally go to, I mean, I'm not a moron, <laughs> you know, when it comes to, to phones at this point, but I'm an Android person. I've been Android for, you know, years. And I thought, this last time, I thought, well, hell, but, you know, I always like iPhones. It's so much easier, <laughs> yeah. he said. <laughs> and I went to an iPhone this last year, and I'm like, Mike, I'm at a loss. Plus, you have to pay for everything. I know. <laughs> I know. They're t- they are terrible. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. So, going back in time, uh, how old were you when you started gravitating toward acting? You know, I, I can't even say, Tommy, that I, I gravitated toward acting. I think acting towards, kind of gravitated towards me. Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> I, I grew up because of my, uh, in, the, in my theater family, you know, because of my, my family background, I right. guess. And, uh, you know, I, my godfather started the actor studio. Um, my grandfather was, even though he was a set designer for this theater, and I think most people would be like, yeah, so, but because he was so revered and, uh, you know, one of the greatest, like, in his in his field that, like, ever lived, um, even in his time. Yeah. Like, he was so influential uh, that if he did not, wouldn't do a musical or a play, uh, it didn't get produced. That's how influential he was. So, um, and he was, the, the, I mean, most of the time, like, here's the people who were, like, in our household. Right. Uh, and we lived in the Dakota. So, uh, most of the people that were in our household all the time were, like, Tennessee Williams. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, my dad's father, Ilya Kazan. Um, then we had, like, he always, he always did every uh, Rogers and Hammerstein show. So, we always had the Richard Rogers. We always had the Hammersteins. I didn't know who they were, but, um, because I was like five, you know, uh, yeah. but 
at the same time, oh yeah, I have no idea who Paddy Chayefsky was, and I couldn't figure out why he had a girl's name. Um, <laughs> and so this is, you know, what we, what I grew up around, and I never thought at the time, you know, oh, I want to do that. I want to be an actor, but I love being in it. That's all. I just that, that was my world. So I, my grandfather. Uh, died uh, when I was about 11, mm-hmm. and of course our lives drastically changed, um, and uh, I, was, I was living with uh, you know, my, my mom, um, went from literally the Dakota to Louisiana, um, that's not a drastic change, um, and then we and then went back up to Massachusetts, and at that point, my biggest thing in life was wanting to be a model. Mm-hmm. That was way more important than, of course, acting. Uh, in my, you know, 12 to 13 year old brain. And and so uh, I just happened to, it just found me, you know, to, to audition for this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just such a powerful, powerful film. And my part was so much me. Uh, this, and again, this, unfortunately, it never got, never got finished. That's what's so sad about it. But it was at Book Shield, um, mm-hmm. and Cliff Robertson was directing it. And it was a, uh, a film set in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And, oh, my God, the, the DP was Jomos Zygmunt. Jomos Zygmunt was the uh, director of photography for, like, um, Amadeus. Uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right. and a lot more later that I can't remember, but I mean, he was just really famous. So this is, it was a top-notch uh, film, and, and, and we filmed like half the movie, um, and uh, unfortunately they, you know, ran out of money. But uh, I realized that I was really good. Not only was I just really good, but most I could get a lot of my, like, pain off. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, so at that point, I wrote to my godfather and um, uh, to, to Van, and I asked, you know, if, at the time, I didn't know, I didn't really understand the actor's studio. And I said, hey, can you help me get into the actor's studio? And his response was, why? I don't know it work. And that was the end of that, so so much for the help. Yeah. Uh, when I, so then I just went to New York and I went back to my modeling, and uh, you know, being being not the uh, the person who's always the rebel. Yeah. And they were you know telling me, oh here's the Sears catalog uh, that you can do for kids. So I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to be a Vogue model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, so that I, uh, of course, I broke the mold and started doing that, you know, um, because nobody told me I couldn't. Oh, that's good. Anyway, yeah. always remember that. Don't listen to anybody. Um, and then once again, you know, another director wanted me to tell me again and said, hey, would you audition for this film? And I was totally resentful, by the way, about it. I'm like, oh my God! I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to audition. Didn't care. And of course, you know what what happens when you do that. You get it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Of course. And that was, and that was a little bad. Yeah, I think that um, Elliot Kazan was um, one of the best film directors of the uh, golden age of Hollywood. You know, I think I think he gets short shrift though because of all that McCarthy bullshit. But I think he was just extraordinary. What was he like as a Godfather? He could be really cranky. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I would. Uh, uh, when, when we were in a taxi, mm-hmm. I would ask him to get to stop, uh, if I could stop, like, at the corner before we got to uh, where we were going. Yeah. And he would, he would give the taxi driver, like, a dime. <laughs> 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 and 
and the guy would like talk back at him and say, you, you need it more than I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just, oh my God. And, uh, he, you know, or we would go into a bakery, just my favorite bakery was a Napoleon. He was going to the bakery and he was really cranky toward the baker and I would just shrink. <laughs> But he was, you know, he got a little bitter, as I must say, as he got older. And I don't, I don't blame him, uh, in, in a sense. Um, there would be people in the street, and yeah. we walked down the street, who we would just, you know, you're the greatest director that ever lived. And he would walk down the street, and people would say, uh, you know, call him a, uh, 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 you know, enemy, or, uh, you know, betrayer, you know, things like that. that that's, that's of course. Cool. Um... But there were things that, you know, valuable lessons that she gave me. And, but, but nothing in acting. It was just a, as an artist uh, that I, that popped up in my life. And I think that really formed me. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that, that she taught me most important is um, there isn't anybody else that's more important than you. Right. On the set. And be more interested in what somebody else does in a conversation when you're speaking to somebody. Right. Uh, than talking about yourself. So, and I saw that in action. And my grandfather had that gift, too. Um, they could be speaking to a, you know, a plumber. And... Mm-hmm. They would make him feel like the most important plumber in the world and make his profession feel really important. And and, and it meant it. This is just who they were because they were fascinated. Oh, look at, so when you do the plumbing, so you break into the wall and then, and then what? And then they go together like that? Oh, yeah. And then, and see, then I take the copper fittings and, you know. And, you know, and, and then he, you would see this man, like, come alive. And you got to see the human being come out. Right. And it was a reveal their human nature. That's what, what happens, is you reveal the human nature. Um, and it actually makes it, being able to see that, and then being able to, to then be created out of my life and do that makes it even harder to live in the society we're in now, uh, which is all about self and me and me and selfies and uh, because it's all about being more interested in the other person. And the other thing that he taught me is, um, you know, listen 90% of the time, speak 10 yeah, that's good advice, you know, because um, acting is reacting, as uh, certain people said. Responding, if I could correct you on that, Tommy. Responding, yes. Yeah. How, how long was it before you got into the actor studio? Oh, my God. Believe it or not, that was actually towards the end of my career. Mm-hmm. So I was about 27 years old. I had I'd gotten into, I was actually like a professional actor. Right. I, I mean, professional being paid, right? Right. Uh, as an actor, you know, little darling started at 14. So I'd be, I call that professional uh, actor. Um, and then all the way up to 27 years old. And, uh, so it, it was 20, I didn't get in my first time, film the first time, um, but the second time I, I did get in, so I was 27 when, when I got in. Um, I, at that point, I had already been studying uh, for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. I made sure, at that point, my branch, my Godfather, a little later on, uh, had started to lose, you know, his marbles a little bit. Uh, but it was very, very important to me that I, uh, it was just, I was never going to feel like um, I was worthy, I guess, until I was a member of the Active Studio and I was of the level of my, my family members. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was that level of artist. 
and uh, I, I just was going to feel like a fake until the then. And I could see, to me, I can see that my acting work, you know, when I do TV shows and stuff, I cringe. Um, and uh, it was, unfortunately, as I said, it was really towards the end of my career um, after I really mastered my art uh, that, um, you know, that I, I got into the actor's studio. And then uh, at that point, at that point, you know, when you're doing work that's so deep and so... Uh, it's changing, you know, life changing to yourself and other humans. It's very difficult to continue on, like shows like, you know, Melrose Place. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so, was Little Darlings the first audition after that Brooke Shields in, um, movie audition? Yes, it was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What um, What did you uh, think uh, when you read the script? I thought, Jesus, how did they get, how did they know me so well? <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, just, the, just because of the part of Cinder? Yes. Because I was already dating older guys, you know, then, and, um, it was, you know, it was already a part of me anyway, so I thought that they, you know, that the screenwriter had been following me around secretly. It was easy. Yeah. Wow. I, I I would never have guessed because usually when someone is playing a character who's uh, kind of a bitchy character, usually the, the person's the, the quite quite the opposite of that character. Oh, that, I, I, I certainly was, but 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 the the um, you know the sketch of the character was certainly me. It's just what side you know of the character. I just had to go, well, well what, what side of me you know, would I be? And Cindy was the darker side um, of me. So I just took the, the shadow side of me and went towards that with the character of Cinder. I see. So I already understood that she was extremely insecure. I was not. Um, and she hid that. So that's you know, that's what I I understood. I was I was always bullied. I was never a bully, and she's a bully. Yeah. Um, so that uh, that's the only thing I had to turn around. But you know, the, the fact that you know, she, uh, was a model that she dated over guys that she didn't want to be there because you know she she felt that these were with kids that that was me. Um, but. You know, I, was, I never treated anyone badly, you know. It, 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 if anything, I was, I was always treated badly. And in fact, it, uh, that's kind of what happened on the set anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard you say in a previous, previous interview that uh, Christy McNichol broke your wrist because you called her a lesbian. <laughs> Was it was yeah. it was it exactly a lesbian or was it the D word you called her? <laughs> oh, gee, now Tommy, you, you, you got me. Uh, yeah, I think I might have called her a bike. I think I might have called her both. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, and this is when we were playing volleyball, like you know, uh, in at the hotel. Right. And not. Um, but, you know, she had been, like, really mean, and I got it. So, you know, I called out the obvious, and we all knew. Yeah, I mean, I, I met her a month before the pandemic started at a Comic Con, and I thought she was just uh, an absolute sweetheart. And uh, we got we got a, a couple pictures of us hugging. That was just so cute, you know. And it was it was one of my favorite experiences uh, meeting somebody at a convention. Yeah, poor girl. I'm so glad that you know. It's unfortunate that she happened to be to be born, you know, a decade before. Yeah. I think, I think she would have been totally different. Yeah. Was 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 Tam O'Neill difficult to work with? Uh, Tatum and I actually became 
friends. Uh, but it, but not more like a good acquaintances. She was, you know, very standoffish at the same time because of, you know, she protected herself because she wasn't sure if, if people were friends with her because. Mm -hmm. How was uh, working with Cynthia Nixon? Well, uh, what an angel. Yeah. What an angel. She's just, I'm so, I'm so happy for her. Um, who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah, really. If, you know, if, 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 really, if you, if I had to go back there and, you know, just sit on that log where we shot, you know, the, the, one of the last scenes where I get punched by Cynthia um, and look at all of those people uh, about where they would go and what would happen to them, I, including myself, I would never have predicted the trajectory. Yeah. I mean, she had a pretty good career already before Sex in the City. You know, I mean, she was in Amadeus and... After Sex in the City, yeah, I mean, her career uh, just got better and better from there. It's amazing. Yep. And they were both doing, uh, they were both doing Broadway and Off-Broadway, so that's how we knew each other there, too. Mm -hmm. I, was doing the, I was doing The Runaways with Diane Lane, um, and I suppose Cynthia was doing uh, Hurley Burley, I think. Yeah. Wow. How about uh, working with Matt Dillon? Oh, Matt and I were both unknowns, of course. Mm -hmm. um, all he wanted, Matt, you know, had a, I don't know if he'll ever admit it, but I know he had a crush on me. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, of course, I was into, like, you know, like my character, but, you know, the 27-year-old guys, and I was like, oh, the kid. Uh, but that was just a typical, you know, uh, typical teenager. He liked to trick, smoke pot. Yeah. And pretty much talked exactly as his character did. <laughs> yeah, he was coming off of Over the Edge at the time. Yeah. We had both things talked about, both of us. Uh, at Paramount is, you know, being the next big thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, my my parent and manager decided to take a shot west and that uh, took care of that. What was um, Ronald, Ronald Maxwell like as a director? I heard he's kind of like Stanley Kubrick. He likes a lot of takes. He's, I'm sorry, but he's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, if he likes a lot of takes. <laughs> um, he's just, the fact that he, he, he's in real life, that he's a bigoted white supremacist, doesn't yeah. surprise me. Um, because he just is not a real likable person. And he never ever had a sense of humor. Just this never, you know, shenanigans that one has off camera, you know, just the, when you're bored or you've been working so hard and, you know, you just kind of play little pranks on one another. Right. Um, he never, he never, like, got into that. He would just get really angry. And we thought, my God, this guy has, like, no sense of humor whatsoever. Uh, nobody really liked him. Uh, he's not a real likable person, unfortunately. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just, he, yeah, he, he had a lot of takes. Uh, he's not a real actor's director. Right. Uh, he's, I don't know what kind Whatever director he is, it's in his head. Huh. And he doesn't really let anybody else know. But, you know, he, that's a typical narcissist for you. Interesting. Wow. Now, on the other hand, he had 
two children. Uh, one of them uh, was Olivia, and Olivia was, uh, yeah, was 14. Olivia, I think, was about eight yeah. at the time. And I pretty much ended up growing up with Olivia and know her to this day. So, you know, I didn't work with Ron again, but on the other hand, I, I kind of continued to know him through Olivia. Nice, nice. So how does um, Hello Larry come into the picture next? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> how does that uh, come into the picture next? Was that just a standard audition? I did not want to do Hello Larry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did not want to do it. Uh, that was a decision uh, that was... My mom, yeah. unfortunately, I was underage. I could not be emancipated. And my manager and my mom saw the dollar signs. Um, and uh, they pretty much were going to offer it to me. Anyway, the only thing I really had to do was stand there and read for the, uh, you know, for the network on set. And it was offered. And I, I knew it was going to destroy my career. I knew it. As I told you at that point, you know, Matt and I were being spoken about as the next big thing. And just before Little Darlings was going to come out, it was who was going to snap us up? Mm -hmm. Who was going to give us the offers? And sure enough, that's what happened. And when the offers came in, I was stuck in this gut of a series. Yeah. Um, so I don't look fondly on that. Um, I was not, you know, I didn't, and that's, I, unfortunately that, that was just what, what uh, changed everything of the trajectory of my career. And I mean, the whole Mary makes, the only thing for many Mary makes lists of is one of the worst series of all time. Yes, <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never got to see the show, but I saw, you know, um, when they were all on the Facts of Life a couple times. Uh, no, that, we did different strokes crossovers. Different strokes, I'm sorry. I always, yeah. get, I always get those two mixed up. Yeah, <laughs> McLean Stevenson, yeah, I, I heard uh, he was a dick to a lot of people uh, on MASH. Yeah. Remember, you heard the story that he didn't even know he was going to get fired? Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he found out, like, on the show that they got killed. Yeah. <laughs> That's just like, you know, uh, somebody who finds out that their series got canceled by reading the newspaper, you know? Right, right. And, uh, and that was, of course, that was another reason why the show was you know, doomed. Yeah. Because it was uh, he had complete control over... Right into the very thing that Donald Wolf got fired for. 
Oh, my God. Okay. Yep. So out of the fire and into the frying pan. And, it's, you know, of course, who did I seek out? Uh, being so miserable uh, right away with Mackenzie Phillips. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, crazy. You're my uh, second guest from the first time. I t Which movie? The, the, I did two first times. I did an independent film called The First Time, and then I did a movie of the week called The First Time. The independent film. So who, who, who was it? Robert Trevor. I don't know who that is. He was the, he was the uh, the goofy Jewish guy that was in it. God, I still don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> All I remember is Tim Choate and and Wallace Shawn. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. I mean, he said he had a good experience making it though, and he remembered you, and he said that you were pleasant, but. That was just about all that yeah, he remembered. But I used to go to uh, the video store and I'd see this movie on the shelf when I was a kid, but it wasn't until YouTube that I actually saw it, like maybe 12 years ago or so. Uh, was was that a good experience? Yeah, it really, it really was. The, the director, uh, was, I think just had like, uh, like only a couple of degrees at a film school or something, Charlie Loventhal. Yeah. Um, she was just awesome. What a sweet guy. And uh, I think he actually told me that he wrote the movie uh, loosely based on his real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would be too surprised. I mean, life imitates art or art imitates life, you know? Right, right. Right. And I'm, I'm actually surprised that, that Charlie didn't take off as a director. Once again, I just think it was, you know, the time. Had he made that now, he would have been a huge director. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah, he made a movie with Scott Valentine called uh, My Demon Lover and they ended up starting a production company for a while after that and I don't know something happened with it. Uh, Scott's going to be coming on the show soon so I'll find out uh what happened. But Yeah. Do you remember uh, do you remember Wendy Joe Sperber at all? Okay. Do you remember Wendy Joe Sperber at all? Oh, god, yes. Wendy actually like for a while, like for a minute there, she was like, you know, everybody had to hire her. You know, she was like the the slave over the minute there. You know, you couldn't make a show without Wendy Jo in it. And she died way too soon. She was so talented. Oh, I didn't know she died. Yeah, I think in the mid two thousands she died of breast cancer. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, she was she was great. I wonder if yeah, she could still be working to this day, if, if, if that's the case. That's the only reason why she, you know, now I understand why she's still working, because she's dead, because I, I, there's no reason why she still wouldn't be working. She was just that good. Absolutely. Now we get to the notorious Jekyll and Hyde together again. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> I used to see this on Comedy Central ad nauseum back in the 90s. Um, how was making that movie? Once again, it was another movie that I knew was going to be a dud. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't, but it, it, you know, because it was, it was just so, it, you know, it was jumping on, of course, the whole airplane, yeah. uh, you know, genre. And the only ones who could really do the airplane genre was airplane. Um, but we started off really well. The problem was Jerry had about 16 writers on the movie. Right. So we, we kept uh, changing it. You know, I mean, that, was, that film went to seven, eight drafts. Can you imagine? Wow. And then it was, it was still being rewritten while we were shooting. So it, 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 was, it was, by the time the enthusiasm of it started to wane, you know, about halfway through, because we knew that it was being rewritten so many times that, and with that kind of humor, you know, with that kind of slapstick humor, 
you can't do that. It, there has to be a flow. Um, we knew that it was, or at least, you know, some of us did. <laughs> you know, I knew it. Uh, the producer, Mary Gordon, and Joel Silver knew it. But the writer, director, Jerry Belson, and the star, Mark Langfield, and they were, you know, sick of Steve's at that point. Plus, mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but they were doing a lot of drugs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that didn't help. You know, speaking of, uh, boy, it might imitate art, right? Right. Uh, in that film, you know, I was not. <laughs> By that time, I was completely, like, out of it. I was, I was out of all of that. Um, but uh, it was with the experience, I must say, I mean, the, the thing is, what was great is I had not done, like, a huge budget film yeah. like that before, and it was huge. I mean, they spent a lot of money um, at Paramount for that. Wow. So, that's, you know, another one that was not uh, sadly. Uh, I actually, and unfortunately, it also made me, because when the film was coming out and they had thrown so much money at it, Yeah. Uh, that, it, and that was going to be like this summer hit coming out, but when it was, when they were test, uh, when they were doing test audiences for it, and they were getting like, you know, everyone was like, this is a dud. Um, all Paramount knew at that time was, oh, we have something stinky yeah. you know, on our hands. <laughs> and I was in the middle of auditioning for Wow. Uh, yep. And I was, it was down to like two people. And Adrian Lyon was made an offer um, to my, uh, had made an offer. So I had an offer to do the film, Bush Dance. It was, but at that time, Paramount, all Paramount was thinking is we have a stinky. <laughs> <laughs> on our hands, and she's in that stinky. Yeah. <laughs> and and they didn't, you know, it wasn't, they didn't even, it's not like, you know, oh, it's Krista Erickson who's bad. That that wasn't it. It's that there's a bomb where it's going to cost us a lot of money, and her name is in that bomb. Um, no. We're not going to take the chance of, you know, having part of that stink in flash pants. And unfortunately, <laughs> I got passed over. They wouldn't. Adrian Lyon had to then go to Chicago and take his second pick. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I, I, I can picture you in flash dance, though. I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. I mean. And that was hard. I mean, that, that was like eight auditions. You know, for that. And, and wow. it, I mean, talk about a cattle call. You know, that's how they started it. It was a cattle call. And and this is with people with names. Yeah. And, and we had to do dance auditions and dance auditions and dance, you know, over and over again. Um, it, it was uh, tight. So, I mean, I, for me to get up to where I got to and then an offer was, was quite a feat considering the fact that not only was everybody in Hollywood called, but everybody, you know, outside of Hollywood was called. And I still got an offer, so. Are you, are you, are you a trained dancer? Yes, I am. In, in everything, tap, ballet, all that stuff? No, not tap. Um, I went from ballet, but I was really known as a jazz dancer, more jazz. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. You are uh, you're my third guest from Deadly Lessons. Uh, Diane Franklin was my very first guest, and she's been on here seven times, and she's going to be on here an eighth time soon. Wow! And, and uh, Dina Friedman has been on here too. Uh, how was that experience? What's that? What experience? Dancing? Yeah. Uh, Deadly Lessons. Oh, Deadly Lessons. <laughs> Oh my God! I, I completely forgot about it. I, I what is it about? I forgot the film. 
it's a, it's like a um, an all girls school, and um, there's uh, killings going on. Who started it? Diane Franklin, and okay. D- and Dina Friedman, and Ali Sheedy, Nancy Cartwright, Bill Paxton. Jesus, that sounds like a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't remember it. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a TV movie of the week. Okay. You say so. <laughs> That's I'm a. Sorry, I just don't remember it. I don't think it's even on my IMDb. It was when I found it. Yeah. I'll be damned. Well, obviously, uh, I can't. I can't tell you how the experience was because I can barely remember it. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We'll skip yeah. that. How was um, a guest starring on Fame? Um, they were, it was it was a nice. It was really a, a, a great experience. They were, I had another part that I was offered, but it had a part that was just uh, singing, a singing part. Mm-hmm. And even though I sing great, uh, I'm a fabulous singer uh, with a. Um, you know, with a shampoo bottle um, when no one's around and in the shower. Um, at an audition, they didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the part. <laughs> so I got another part, and uh, it was, you know, it was great. It was great. Um, it was a wonderful... There was some guest starring roles that I had that were, you know, just so much fun. Not the family was one of those where I just had a ball because you can just go so far out there as far as you want uh, in a character and you can't, you can't go too far. Yeah. And, and you have actors who just go, okay, I'll meet you there. And that, you know, that was the, uh, those are the ones that you remember. Yeah, do you remember anything about Valerie Landsberg or Debbie Allen? I'm sorry? Do you remember anything about uh, Valerie Landsberg or Debbie Allen? Um, just that they were, you know, they were really talented uh, actors. Mm-hmm. Very humble. You know, that's what I like when I'm working with, or when I do, when I'm just starring. And, you know, you're working on a show and, you know, you have actors who are just like, hey, we're just, you know, thrilled to be working in a series. We don't know how long it's going to last, but we're grateful. You know, and, uh, you, you love working with people like that. Do you remember being on uh, The Powers of Matthew Starr? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Because I, I worked with Peter Barton, like, on a couple of things. So we already knew each other pretty well. Yeah, I've talked. I've talked to Peter. He's a good guy. He's a great guy. Oh, he's awesome. And uh, you know, unlike his, you know, his really squeaky clean image, um, we would get got blasted. You know, <laughs> drunk. Oh my God! Thank God they didn't have the the uh, you know the the laws. Well, you know, thank God we didn't hurt anybody actually. But after this, we would. When, when you're shooting in places like that, you shoot way out in the, like in the, in the desert. So, uh, in the desert, um, you know, in, in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. uh, that's where all the margarita places are. <laughs> 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 After a long day's work, Peter and Amy Steele and, um, you know, a couple of us uh, would, you know, hang out and just drink the until you're just blottoed. Um, and uh, then, you know, of course, we had to drive home and, oh, things that I would never do today. But, um, yeah, he was, he was awesome. He was such a nice guy. Louis Gossett, I had done two shows with as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, what a, what a gentleman. He is such a, he reminds me of if, if Sidney Poitier was in a uh, in the human, it was in another body, it would be Louis Gossett. 
Nice, nice, yeah. I, and Amy, I've talked to her. She's a great lady. She is, yeah. She's, she's awesome. She has a great sense of humor. Yep. Very and, good sense uh, of humor. You know, very... Uh, yeah, she, she, she has, you know, she's always been very, uh, what is it, not self-effacing, but, um, yeah, she, she's never, she's, uh, she's very hard, humble, I guess is the word. Yes. Yeah, very humble. Always was. She's very humble, and also she doesn't suffer fools, you know, and, you know, she, she knows exactly what she wants, when she wants it. Okay. Yeah, That's right. she's just terrific. Uh, you worked with a friend, a, a friend of mine, uh, Karen Richmond, on the new Gidget. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? I don't know. What show is it? <laughs> the, the new Gidget. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> That's not on IMDb either. It's right here in front of me on IMDb. What does it say? Let's see. There's no plot to the episode listed. The the, the show the episode was called the the project. Um, it was you, Lily Hayden, guest starring, and yeah, Karen was 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 Gidget, of course, and William Shallert was on the show. Dean Butler, right. Sydney Penny, yeah. I don't remember that either. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to bring it up to you. How about uh, Mama's Family? That's what I was telling you about. Mama's Family. You know, I said I had so much fun. Yeah. The character so far out there that you, know, you can you can just go as far out there with the character because it's farce, almost, right? Yeah. So... You can just go way out there. Sometimes I would try something and just, and I'd end up cracking myself up. We'd end up cracking each other up. Um, and we just stop, you know, because you just, you're doing something so out there and you're working with actors who are also doing that. And so, you know, you try something that is just way out there. Because uh, you have those kind of characters that you can do that with, and really, it's like improvisation. They're like, "Okay, we'll go there with you," and we, we just keep going. I had a blast. I wish I could have done more of, those, of that show. I would have loved to have guest uh, starred more often on that. She, yeah, Vicki Lawrence is such a genius, and you know she got she got to be a part of that last era where someone could just get discovered just by chance. You know, she wrote a letter to Carol Burnett, and Carol Burnett casted her on the show uh, when she was only eighteen years old. Yes, I heard that. Yeah, that is the, I, that's so unheard of now. Met Harvey Corman. Yeah. Oh my. Harvey Corman or the brilliant Horace Leachman. Right. I, I actually interviewed uh, Harvey Corman's son a few months back. What, what does he do? Um, I mean, he just, you know, preserves his father's memory and all of that stuff. You know, he's got a um, Facebook group and he does a lot of interviews and stuff. I can tell it's been... It, it's it's widely affected him, you know, being his son, and just yeah. people have just you know taken advantage of him. It's it, it's really really sad. I I, fe yeah. I felt for the guy. Yeah. What does he do himself? I can't remember <laughs> to be honest, because uh, we were oh. just we we're talking about his dad the whole time. Wow. Yeah. And he, and he was one of those guys, you know, I couldn't get a word in edgewise because he was just all over the place and stuff. Oh. But um, we're connected on Facebook, and I see his postings. But, right, right. yeah, it's it's not easy being related to an icon, for sure. Well, you got Mel Brooks' sons, you know. Um, they're pretty famous and well-known. Yeah. And they were both involved in the yeah, even though Mel's still here with us, but, um, you know, they, 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 they carry on the legacy of 
you know, Mel Brooks and with Brooks Films, and they're pretty, they're really cool guys. You have Chris Lemon, mm-hmm. uh, Jack Lemon's son, and then Chris Mathau, um, Walter Mathau's son, uh, and they do, you know, really well. Um, you know, these are all people, but I don't know Mel Brooks' son, but I do know Chris Lemon and, and uh, wait, is Chris Lemon? Charlie! Charlie Mathau, sorry. Charlie Mathau. Right. And I know them. And, you know, they're really intelligent guys. Uh, now, yeah, so I, it depends upon, you know, the father. Now, I also, of course, Jack Lemon, by the way, was was uh, one of my judges in the actor studio. Um, oh, nice. And uh, that was the one I passed. <laughs> <laughs> It was my, my judges uh, for at the studio was it was Jack Lemon, it was uh Kelly Winters and Paul Newman. Uh huh. Wow. That's a lineup. I just, <laughs> yeah. I wish I would have never turned the lights on, Tommy, I swear to God. <laughs> that is so cool though that you got that experience. Uh, oh my god. I'm telling you, I wish I wish I would have never known. Yeah, I wish I would have turned the lights on after the audition. Yeah. <laughs> so I would have seen who I was being judged by, not before. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, <laughs> I can imagine it'd be pretty nerve wracking. Did you Did you know James Lipton? Yeah, the, the, my only issue with that is uh, is that the public has been given the impression that, you know, the actor studio is a place where you go to school. Right. And it's not. Um, there's the Lee Strasberg Institute, and then there's the actor studio, which is, and people think that the actor studio is Lee Strasberg's, and it's not. And that is a... a, a that's a, a bothers many of us. Right. And, and that's not done accidentally. You know, that's that's uh, what we wanted. And James Lipton, you know, helped out immensely. Right. Um, brand the actor studio, you know, Lee's. And uh, it, thank, thank God, thank God, they still preserved it. You know, there's not opened it up. Right. Uh, anyway, but but that my, was my only issue with, with, with some, you know, branding it. Um, and then some of the, you know, people they interviewed, you know, especially towards the end, I was like, oh, come on. Yeah. You know, the cast, the cast of, uh, you know, of... Um, the Simpsons. Um, <laughs> Billy Joel. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, come on, <laughs> you know, please, this isn't worthy of the actor's studio. No. Oh, I think Elton... And, 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 you know. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, Elton John was interviewed on there, too. I was like, what the, oh what the, God. what the fuck is this? <laughs> right? Yeah, I never understood that, you know. It's sad, you know, when something special happens and it becomes a business, it's just, it's not appealing anymore. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's on that same note, actually, mm-hmm. um, when I, you know, one of my goals, uh, when I began to study, as I told you, and, you know, I wanted to be worthy of mm-hmm. my, uh, you know, of my, my family and predecessors, um, I was going to study with all of the teachers who created the actor studio, and that was four. Uh, with Stella Adler, Sanford Meisner, Meisner mm-hmm. um, Lee Strasberg, and uh, I, I might get this wrong, so forgive me, everybody, but I think it was Larry Moss. Um, and uh, I did not get to Larry Moss, I don't think, but I did study with Stella. Right. Um, and everybody has their Stella stories. Yep. Um, I did study with uh, Meisner. And the whole point was when the, when the actress studio split up, every, 
every one of those teachers who I just spoke of took a piece of the Stanislavski method. They didn't take the entire method. They took a piece of it. And Strasburg piece was uh, emotional, um, what we call emotional uh, recollection, right? Right. Um, and um, Meisner took uh, listening, listening and receiving. Um, and um, I can't recall everything offhand. But so in order to be a well-rounded doctor, you really had to study with all of them. And the last person I studied with was Lee, right? Right. But Lee, like, soon after died. And when he designated uh, Dominic Masaccio to take over for Lee uh, for the studio, so I was studying with Dominic Masaccio. And it was only very, like, within six months that Masaccio uh, said, uh, this type of acting is dead. The method is dead. It doesn't work. And he began to teach uh, acting in an entirely different way. Right. And uh, that didn't go over well <laughs> with Susan Strasberg. Um, so he was asked to, uh, to leave. But many of us at that point were hooked. And uh, um, we followed him. That, that's why I ended up in Rome, actually, because he started teaching in, in Italy. Uh, so I thought many of us followed him, and I was one of them. We followed him to Italy to teach. Um, and then was, at that point, he became quite a name and went to Los Angeles, and he was a force to be reckoned with. But um, the actor studio, it was because of Dominic, pretty much, that I, weirdly enough, that I got into the actor studio. It's because of his work. Yeah. How was it over there in... I was going to say, how was it over there in Rome? I, I've always wanted to go there. Well, I have to say that that was the quarter of my life was spent. Um, I, that's where I met my husband. Uh, that's where I became a journalist. I have my two beautiful stepsons mm -hmm. there, so I guess I'm biased. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, your own Roman holiday. <laughs> yeah, I always thought about that. You know, I always thought about that. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, they're both, each place has its, uh, you know, has its ups and downs. You know, it, when I was in Italy, I was uh, complaining that uh, of all the great things that we have in America. When I'm in America, I was always complaining about all the great things in Italy. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, uh, but at this point, if you had to ask me, frankly, I, I would probably be in Italy, especially, you know, where, where we are now. Of course. In, in our country. Yeah. One last movie I want to ask you before we get to uh, journalism, uh, Mortal Passions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like you, uh, towards the end of your acting career, you were going for these low-budget thrillers. Uh, how was that experience? Um, well, it's funny you say that, because Mortal Passions, uh, another one I didn't really want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, it probably could have been better if I had not been resenting it the whole time. Um, at that point, I had also, at that point, I had was in the actor studio. Mm -hmm. But I was so into myself. <laughs> I, was so, <laughs> it, I was so full of myself at that point. You know, so I was thinking, oh, here I am on this low-budget film, and I'm so great as an actor, degrading myself in this, that uh, I was just such full of ego. And uh, so now I'm doing this film, and I, the, the thing that sticks out the most mm -hmm. about, about Mortal Passions is 
Uh, then I was working with David Warner. Yeah. Uh, who I, could, I loved and admired so much, but I couldn't, you know, tell him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This is kind of big. He's like, you know, this is like his, you know, 170th film. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he was just, you know, he didn't, probably didn't even know like, what film he was on. Yeah. Um, but he was like, all right, walk out to the set. Yeah. You know, what, what number is this? Okay, do his lines, come back, get on the phone, go back to London. You know, that, that was, uh, you know, his, his thing. And I was, right. we had, I had three scenes with him where I was like very emotional. Because he, he played the psychiatrist. Um, and I was this psychotic um, who was always, you know, as, in the film I was very emotional and crying about my marriage, but, you know, also at the same time, because I'm, you know, a sociopath, I'm always trying to play. <laughs> you know, and I was always trying to play the psychiatrist. So these three scenes I had, so I am really just, you know, into my thing and trying to get into my character and, you know, just walking around with my headphones on, you know, just getting deep and, you know, having no one talk to me because I have to do this deep thing and I'm deep. And Warner, David Warner is just sitting in, in his, on his set, in his chair, just, you know, <laughs> calmly just waiting to start. You know, as I'm like, you know, getting deep inside myself and listening, and I'm, you know, I'm deep. And it was just also so, you know, you're, you're looking at this fantastic professional actor, probably just looking at me going, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's so crazy. You know, just looking at my, I, was, I thought I was just so, you know, deep and big. Um, and I look at it now, and I saw the film, and I thought, I see it now, I thought, God, David Warner was just so much better than I was. And of course he was, because he just, he was relaxed. You know, he was just, he was present. That was the whole point. Yeah. He was present. I was not. And that was, by the way, the difference with, with what Dominic was teaching. The reason why the method didn't work is because you're not present. You're so busy having a personal experience on stage that the audience somehow feels, you know, they're missing it. Yeah. Because, I, you know, you're, you're too busy having this, like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm having this angst, you know, rather than just recall being present and, as I said to you, responding. Because when you're reacting, you're not really present. When you respond, you are. Right. And when you're responding to what is happening right in front of you, right there, an audience will pick that up because you are right there. You're present. You're not reacting to something that you've already rehearsed. The audience picks that up immediately. When you are present and responding, then the, you have the audience. They're like, oh, you're there. You're awake. You're alive. And that, that's, that's supposed to be different. That's why he had said the message is dead. Mm-hmm. I've that, that's what I was witnessing. I was into this whole personal thing when it showed up on film. However, yeah. my, my surprise, uh, I ended up winning like all these acting awards from World of Passion. So go figure. Yeah. <laughs> I've met uh, Zach Galligan a few times. He's an interesting guy. Zach was, he was extremely funny. He had me, he, he, would, he had me in stitches. I don't know what he's like now because I haven't seen him, but he was very, very funny. Yeah, and the, the, uh, the Englishman that's in the movie, Alan Shearman, uh, I've talked to him. Uh, uh, him and Mark Blankfield, they were in a, a stage show uh, called Bullshot Crummond in the 70s. Fridays? Yeah, he he did Fridays. Uh, he did Bullshot Crumman first, and then he went into Fridays, and then um, Jekyll and Hyde together again. Right. Yeah, his career was pretty hot for a while. I'm not sure if Jekyll and Hyde killed me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, he was he guest starred on everything in the eighties and nineties, and he always stole the show. You know, I mean, he played the yeah. blind he played the blind guy in Robin Hood Men Tights, the Mel Brooks movie. Oh man, that was great. He's he, 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 still so talented, but yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know. He, you know, the, the woman, I forgot her name, but, but the redhead that was on Fridays. Um, Melanie Chardoff? What? Melanie Chardoff? No, sh- no, she, that's a brunette. Oh, okay. Yeah, because uh, I've talked to her. Oh, you're talking about uh, Brenda's Kemp, who was his wife, right? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, that was his wife. Yeah. Yeah, she passed away last year, unfortunately. Oh my goodness, God, you're really bumming me out, Tommy. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's go on to something more happy. Um, So what? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, It's good to know. You know, because by the way, Mark and I have the same birthday. We're both May eighth. May eighth. Wow, that's so cool. I'm June sixth. You're June sixth. Yes. I was supposed to be middle of May, but I was two weeks overdue. And I was early, so... Oh, yeah? <laughs> the only person that, that I share the same day and same year is Melissa Gilbert. Gilbert yes, I was just going to say that. You have the exact same birthday she does. Yep. So what made you transition into um, journalism? Um, well, I, once again, I was, um, here I was, I think I told you, really, I'm at the apex, right? Yeah. Of, you know, where I was, I'm now already a member of the actor's studio, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve, um, and I'm really, you know, mastered my art at this point. We're a little farther away from moral passions at this point, I think. Mm-hmm. I've already done, like, two other really awful films. Right. Um, and, uh... You know, I'm doing 90210. And one of the things that I hadn't experienced since Hello Larry, with all of the other TV series that I had done, and including 21 Jump Street, which you didn't mention. <laughs> um, and uh, 20, cause 21 Jump Street was also one of my favorite shows to do mm-hmm. um, because of being able to work with the writers and collaborate so often with them, um, was I hadn't experienced, when I got 90210, um, and it was, it was to transition from the guest, the, what was it, what I, I was already uh, a recurring character, that's what I was, I was a recurring character on 90210, that's what it, what, what it was supposed to be, and I then shot like four episodes. Um, and it, with Hello Mary, I guess because I was 16, mm-hmm. it was a very, it was like, it, it was more like the studio system, you know, with, with Hello Mary. Yeah. Uh, you, you can't go out and do this, uh, you're representing the, you know, the studio, um, you can't be allowed to do this, you can't ask for this, and, you know, you, it was, it was really, uh, oppressive. And, uh. When I got on to 90210, you know, I'm at this point 28, 27, 28, um, it starts all over again. And I hadn't experienced that since Hello Larry. Um, you know, I didn't smoke. I stopped smoking. Mm-hmm. And I had asked for, like, you know, some cigarettes. Um, and they would complain to my agent that I was being demanding. Um, I was being demanding by, by demanding fake cigarettes or something. I mean, it was just crazy. Um, and, uh, Tori and, uh, Shannon, uh, were very, very insecure. So if any actress, even a gay player, uh, was dressed in a way that might look what they thought better than them or threatening, they either had to be put in big glasses or a hat um, or, you know, a scarf over their shoulders. Yeah. And that uh, also applied to me. 
And uh, considering the fact that I was supposed to be playing a sophisticated character, um, that made it difficult. So I would often have to go through things for wardrobe changes uh, uh, because they were so insecure. Uh, it got to the point where all I had to do was see a look on one of their faces, and I would just turn around and go back to my trailer, knowing I was just going to have to change. So th this, the hero was at this point in my career, right? And mm -hmm. just kind of bring you to my, my, my state of mind. And I, I'm thinking, I'm on this show. Uh, it's, I'm really not, what am I saying with my life? Right? Right. <laughs> what am I giving? And, I'm going to go from here, because they already are saying that if, if I don't reoccur here, they're going to bring me over to the new character on Melrose Place. And I believe Daphne is an agent they ended up putting in that, in that role. Um, but at that point, while I was doing that show, I was already going back and forth to Italy. I had already met who was going to be my future husband, who was a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, at, uh, and at, he had, was going to be going to Iran, he told me. Uh, and he decided that uh, I was a great journalist and producer, and I just didn't know it yet. And he had uh, gotten a visa for me to go to Iran. Right. Uh, now... So an Italian citizen going to Iran is a little bit different than an American citizen going to Iran. And at that point, not one American had stepped on Iranian soil since the revolution. Mm -hmm. So I would have been, like, the first. Um, and he said, you know, I've, I've got your visa, <clears throat> and uh, you, I'm going to be leaving a week from now. Let me know what you're going to do. It's waiting here at in Rome for you. Right. Right? Now, let's flash back to what I just told you. I'm on the set of Beverly Hills 90210. Uh, and I'm shooting. And I see Tori and Shannon. They're fighting um, yeah. on the set. Uh, I'm sitting in my chair. And uh, I have a scene coming up. The top person has come right up to Tori and Shannon to show them all the new glasses they have gotten from all of the people. All of the people, by the way, is a, a very, very expensive uh, glasses place. You know, there's uh, up where you get like the most expensive. But every pair of glasses there starts at 300 and up. That's where all the things have to go. And they're able to get it, I guess, for free. And um, so while they're fighting over these glasses, and I'm sitting on the set watching this, uh, I thought to myself, if I die tomorrow, what footprint will I have left on this earth? Is it going to be 90210? <laughs> yeah. We're going to be one of the first Americans to be inside of a theocracy. And I put my script down and I walked out. Literally. Wow. You know, it's like the movie. I put my script down on my chair and walked out. I got on a plane and went to Rome. Right in the middle of shooting. And three days later, uh, I arrived at 5 a.m. in the morning to the museum during the call to go to, you know, to go to, um, oh, it's not Temple, my God, you know, the, uh, I arrived uh, in Tehran. Wow. That is how it happened. That is literally how it happened. Wow. That's pretty yeah. deep. That, all going to the that is pretty deep. Yeah. Oh my God. 
have so I, I mean obviously you enjoy it a lot more than um, the business of acting. Uh, I mean, have you uncovered any like celebrity scandal of like anybody you worked with? Yeah. Um, but I mean, not as a journalist. That not as a journalist. You know, I don't. That wasn't my area. Okay. You know, as a journalist, uh, you know, uh, there weren't a lot of celebrities like in Syria. Yeah. <laughs> 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 or Iraq or Iran. You know, because that's normally my area. Um, you know, I mean, the closest thing I I ever covered. Um, as far as that area was like, I covered Amanda Knox, you know, the yeah. story. Uh, you know, that's not a celebrity scandal. But she, she, she was a person who didn't really want to be a celebrity, actually. Right. Um, but that, as a journalist, that's the person that I came to. I, I, the last thing I was interested in, you know, when it comes to journalism is celebrities and scandals. Yeah, I mean, I, my my family and my friends consider me a journalist because I'm so prolific as a podcaster now, and I think in many ways I am because a lot of my guests I've become very good friends with away from the podcast. Whenever I'm in L.A., um, I get together with them. We talk privately on the phone, and they tell me information that they uh, wouldn't tell me on the podcast and stuff. So okay. I, so I guess in a lot of ways I am, you know. Um, there's another actress I interviewed who became a journalist around the same time you did. Uh, her name's Alicia Naff, and she told me she's like, "Yeah, I consider you a journalist." <laughs> with, you know, uh, with with you know, me telling her all of that, you know, I think it's 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 one of those things, you know. I mean, I did stand up comedy and I acted and stuff, and. I never thought in a million years I'd be d doing a podcast and interviewing people, but I found that it's something I'm really good at. Does it satisfy you? It does. It um, gives me a great satisfaction that it's just, it's, it's hard for me to describe. It's, it's just like, you know, all I have to do is talk and, you know, I guess I have the gift of gab. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, but what do you what, what what have you learned from from doing this these years? I have learned that a lot of my idols are fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've learned that um it's an industry full of um free spirits, uh such as myself who have a bounty sense of humor. And that, um, you know, they've seen everything and I've seen everything and just, uh, we get along so much better. I get along so much better with them than I do with just normal people on the streets, I feel. I think that's probably, you know, it. I think that's probably why, you know, that's, that's why you have this, you know, outlet. And, you know, I've got news. For most people, um, most people are fucked up. Yes. Uh, you know, the only difference is society recognizes uh, people who have a house with a mortgage and, you know, two kids and cars and, you know, the jobs. And on the outside, you know, the, the show that they present to, you know, their neighbors right. and the workers, telling them that they're okay, that they're normal. That's the society that we live in. Yeah. Inside their homes and inside their heads, they are fucked up. Yeah. Emotionally, they're dead. That is the, that is the trade-off, is... They are, and that's why we are where we are. Right. Um, it, they, they can't, they have a person who tells them that to not be self-aware whatsoever, to not have to look within, is absolutely okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> and until and until they get caught, you know, and then then when people are printing, you know, what they did and stuff, then that's the only time when, you know, they they're not seemingly perfect and they they can do no wrong. It could happen yeah. to anybody, probably. Well, in a sense, you know, it could. Uh, but most of the time, it's not. The only time somebody like that, sadly, will wake up is if something tragic happens, you know, in their lives uh, that wakes them up. And, I mean, it could, like, you're t- telling me, you know, you, you know, the car accident. Right. You know, uh, you know, I'm not sure if, if in that case you were different before uh, or not, but it usually for someone to just wake up uh, and just say, wow, it's, it's not about me, um, and just be, you know, conscious in the world and have empathy for your fellow human being. Um, who may be a different color than you, maybe as another socio-economic uh, level, um, who may not speak your language. Right. Um, you know, uh, right. also deserves shelter and food and a job, um, you know, and is not here to uh, threaten you. Um, you know, and that is just basic humanity. That's not even... You know, we're not even going any further than that, but that is just basic humanity. Um, what it usually takes for something like that is for someone to get a diagnosis. Which, can you hear me? Right. Bef- well, before... before. Second, oh, go ahead. One sec. My alarm is going off. And it's, right, it's right in my ear. Oh. <laughs> Bef- it's okay. Uh, what that takes normally is... is you know, a, a diagnosis of cancer, uh, you know what I'm saying? A right. car accident that almost kills them, a disease, uh, somebody dying, a divorce, um, or in some cases, uh, impending death. Right. Right? I, right. I mean, before the accident, I mean, I was a, an empathetic person, but it was still because... You know, I was younger. It was still all about me in many ways, you know. And I was drinking at the time of the accident. And I just feel like I have a much more mature perspective on everything now than I did then. It's, it's made me a better person in a lot of ways. Right. It's, uh, you know, it's not to say that, yeah, you necessarily would have been, you know... Uh, Let's say you know at the at the January sixth rally. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no, 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 no. Insurrection. You know, you went that far, but at the same time, it just shifts everything. It just shifts, and you become with a self awareness uh, of a, on such a profound level, uh, right? Right. That you start to feel like you know this. You could not be alive tomorrow. You know, this is, and you get, you just get a sense of the of the present like never before. And I think what makes it, I think one of the many things about people who are artists in general, right? Is most of us are the black sheep of our family. Those are the people who become artists. Um, is the, you're, you're the black sheep, you're the scapegoats. Right. Uh, there are a few, you know, who are the golden child um, of their family, uh, but they are normally not very good actors. Yeah. Uh, that that only takes you so far. Uh, they're not very good actors, they're not very good singers, you know, artists, you know, painters, you know, you know what I'm saying. It's, yeah. It, it, because uh, that will only take you, you know, so far, because you're not very deep. Exactly, yeah. Al- Alcoholics—they're pretty good actors. They know how to spin a yarn. 
you know. Oh, man. They have to be some of the best actors ever. Yeah. <laughs> the only time they can act is when they're drunk. <laughs> they can't pretend yeah. they're they can't pretend they're sober, you know. <laughs> that's right, that's right. One of the things that I find is when I do some teaching and I see young actors, you know, playing drunk mm -hmm. is so the biggest mistake is you're playing drunk. What a drunk does is try not to be drunk. That's what a drunk does. A drunk doesn't try to be drunk. Right. A, a drunk does everything they can not to be drunk. That's how you have to be a drunk. That is true. That is true. I watched um, about 15 minutes of that documentary you sent me. Yes. The other day, I, I meant to watch the whole thing. I got sidetracked because some personal stuff happened at home. But um, did you produce that? No. What I, what, the reason why I wanted you to see this uh, PBS frontline documentary, Power of the Set, mm -hmm. is this is happening right now. Yes. So this is the whole ball game, Tommy. Right. Right? This is what every American should know. Every single one of us should know this and begin dialogue from there. Right? Right. You follow what I'm saying? Exactly. Um, it's, it's frightening to me that most of us, it's, we, we don't even want to approach the subject of what does the Fed do? Uh, because it's like, oh, I don't, know, I don't understand that. I, 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 you know, even myself. I yeah. almost passed by watching the documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the subject matter. You know, the power of the Fed. I'm like, oh, I don't want to see that. You know, uh, and then I started to see it, and I just, I was like, oh, my God. This is what, this, this is the brain of, of, of what is in the United States is the body. I mean, you know, left, right, politics, you know, that's, that's just like the left arm and the right arm, you know, but this is a brain. And this is where we should all be talking. But, not, but, 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 but none of us even understand it. And I think there's a reason for that. And I, I wanted to, that's the reason why I wanted to, to uh, have you see it. It's just from one American to another mm -hmm. is, is to say, why don't we know this? Why don't we know what is making the world go round? I know. It, I you follow me? I know. It, it, it's capitalism is what I feel. Well, what, the whole, what I understood, actually, is that it's not capitalism. In fact, if you didn't get too far in the documentary book, but one one of the things that the, that the bankers uh, said, and, and um, one of the uh, uh, the bankers who, who was in charge of the uh, of the first bailout uh, said is, he said, I quit because this is the biggest threat to free market capitalism. I'm the free market capitalist. And this is the biggest threat to free market capitalism there ever has been. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we had this 2008 bailout, right? Right. And we thought it was a one-time thing. Now, they didn't turn around and uh, pass it on and lend it out like they were supposed to. That's capitalism. Um, but... You know, we, you know, we, we all the public and the Fed went, oh, well, okay. And we just kind of sucked it up and moved on. That's what we thought. But I just found out in the documentary that, that no, they never stopped. That bailout in 2008 where the, where the Fed, you know, bailed them out and gave them all that money. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't a one-time thing. They had been... 
doing it ever since. He never stopped. Mm-hmm. So basically what, what I understood is since 2008, whenever the central banks and the stock market, um, you know, the, the whole point is of the free market, right, is you bet and you win, you get to keep the profits, right? You bet and you lose, oh well. But the, these guys, the central banks, and, you know, like BlackRock, for instance, right? Right. Like this one, they bet and they lose, the Fed bails them out, just prints more money. That's all they're doing is printing money. Yep. And bails them out. So if I bet and I win, I win. If I bet and I lose, I win. That's the government bailing me out. The government is bailing me out all the time, all the time, all the time. So if, if the government's going to bail me out all the time and I can't lose, I'm not going to invest in U.S. bonds. U.S. bonds is investing in the country because that's a long-term thing. I'm going to invest in things that are really, really risky. Right. Because no matter what, you know, daddy and mommy are going to bail me out. That's socialism. Yep. That's not free market capitalism. That is socialism. Yep. And what what capitalism is, what free market capitalism is, is the Fed, you know, well, the Fed shouldn't be involved at all. Frankly, but the Fed, which is the government, gives them money, and then they take that money and say, thank you, we're solvent again. And then their job is to turn around and lend it out to the, all the other banks around the country, and then those banks are supposed to lend it out to entrepreneurs. Uh, small businesses who want to expand, uh, entrepreneurs who want to start a company. Um, you know, that's, that's capitalism, right? That's right. the whole idea. You know, and that, and of course, entrepreneurs who want to, to invent something, the Facebook, you know, or the next Google, right. um, or, you know, the next gadget, right? Right. Um, that, that brings in employees. That brings in labor. Uh, another company who wants to expand their business and invest in new plants, new technology, new machines, that brings in work. That brings in more employees. That brings in labor. Right? right. That's, that's called, I mean, I'm not, I don't like trickle down, but that is trickle down. But what happened is, they're not, they stopped the trickle down. What I, what I discovered is they didn't do the second part. They got to, the, they gave them all this money, and then they just didn't pass it on to the other banks. The banks did not lend out the money to people. Instead, what they did and what they are still doing is instead of lending it out, they turned around and bought back their own stocks. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, you know our biggest problems today, as far as money, is like student loans and you know um, you know bank loans when they actually existed. You know, um, it's just it's just crazy. You know, I worry about the future of the world. about the future excuse me, of the world is that can you imagine if every at what I just told you yeah. right which I didn't even know a week ago I could not have even told you this if every American knew this what the dialogue would be between us it would be and that was one of the other things in, in the uh, in the documentary is one guy was saying, um, the problem is, is Americans aren't asking the right questions when they go to the town halls. Right. They go to the town halls and say, 
you know, uh, uh, give me a job. Because Americans don't have a house or 401k anymore. But well, yeah, because, you know, we, we took all that away. You're not investing in Americans. You're investing in your own stocks or you're investing in technologies that don't require people. Right. So, you know, so, you, so your profits are even bigger. So, yeah, a, 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 a house or a 401k is out of reach for, you know, this next generation. Absolutely. So he said, so the most important thing for people are their jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, the, the right questions people should be asking at the town halls is, why aren't you raising the interest rates? Because that's... The, that's one of the things, because I think in the documentary at one point, they said that when the Fed or the government said, look, you know, we, this, this free lunch has got to end. Yeah. In order to, we're going to have to raise the interest rates a little bit, because that's what you have to do. You can't just put free money all the time. You just have a printing press in the basement, because that's what the Fed is. Print free money, you can, you've got to balance it somehow, and you do that by having interest rates. And our interest rates have been zero. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not just, you know, like a quarter of a percent, but zero. Right. And even when they spoke about, you know, tapering, the, and that's what we call tapering it off, where they were going to start to raise the interest rates a quarter of a percent, they, uh, Wall Street, had what is now known as a taper tantrum. Right. They literally almost crashed the stock market. They went crazy and sold. And so the, the Fed went, okay, wait a second, no, we're not going to do anything, never mind, never mind. And that's basically what they did. They, they got me open. So if, if you're going to take you know, our, our bottle away and not keep giving us money, we're going to crash the stock market. Okay. Yeah. Fucking. So we have to look. Wait, is America what you, or what I just saw, what I now understood, it saw that documentary, if that documentary, we'd be going to town halls and not asking, where's my $10 an hour job? Right? Why is it more $9 an hour job? So we'd be saying, you know, make them pass that money onto the banks. They can't keep it to themselves. You need to raise the interest rates. Make them hurt. No more COVID socialism. We don't even know this. We're all ignorant. Yep. Does that make sense? It does. It does. You know, Wall Street fucking owns everything now, and we're just, we're in this weird society that we've been, you know, (laughs) <laughs> we've been in since, you know, 9-11 happened and the internet became, you know, God, pretty much. It's right. it's a strange, then, strange time. And when they got, as soon as they got, you know, a taste of, <clears throat> you know, being bailed out for their bad behavior, which, again, we thought stopped. I think, I found out, I think also, we got to the rest of the documentary, but found out that when, um, Trump and McConnell during the COVID right. gave, Wall, gave Wall Street six point one trillion dollars in 2020 alone. Six point one trillion. Yep. Elon Musk <clears throat> was ninety billion dollars richer in one week. Yep. Yep. It's disgusting. And said they. What they do is they have Americans saying, that American is your enemy. <clears throat> that is, you know, fight him. Because if, 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 if you are fighting that other person and saying they're evil, they're bad, what you saw on January 6th didn't happen, um, you're not paying attention to what they were doing. Yep. Yep. It is messed up. But you know, I'm 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 still remaining hopeful that you know we're going to come out of this alive. Well, I wish I, I wish I could stop. You know, I wish I could stop fighting. 
I really do. I wish I could just turn around and stop fighting. Yeah. And just, and just hope. But uh, unfortunately, I'm, as you can hear me, I'm a fighter. You are a fighter, Krista. Very much so. I'm going to end this on a happy note. Um, there's a, a secret silly game that I have that I like to engage my guests in. And what it is, is it's a series of silly slumber party questions. And how this works, Krista, is um, I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question and I answer it. Okay. And it's just it's pure fun, no win or lose, just silliness. And you can comment on answers. Okay. Krista, are you ticklish? Yes. Now I ask you, are you ticklish? Yes. All uh, right. Is that playing the game right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Are you ticklish? I'm very ticklish. Uh, I've been known where? to. I've been where um, under my shoulder blade, my feet, and um, around my belly button. Okay. Yeah, I've been known to hit people in the groin. <laughs> If you tickled me without warning. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, what's your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. Oh, uh, gosh, that's a crazy question. <laughs> uh, but. The butt. The butt, Okay. <laughs> I, I was. I thought you were gonna say, but you know something. <laughs> no, oh, oh, yeah. But the but. Okay, mine is the belly button. Belly button. Ah, uh, that's a better one. Yours is better. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Are you an innie or an outie? I'm an in. Same here. Uh, what color are your toenails painted? The red? I didn't hear you. What was the question? Oh. <laughs> what color are your toenails painted? Oh, uh, natural. Yeah, same here. Well, yeah, that would be interesting if they were pink, you know. Oh, they have been. I, I like to go elaborate when I whenever I do paint them. Awesome. I've been painting them since I was 13. Oh, my gosh. You see, something I didn't know about you. Oh, yes. In fact, the other day I just posted, um, you know, um, you know, I, this, okay, the Summer Olympics is going on right now, right? But in the summer of 96, when I was 13, that's when I started painting my toenails. And, you know, my parents were, like, awfully worried about me, and I was trying to hide it, too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, because I have clothes older than you. Really? <laughs> I'm an old soul, you know. I just, I, I got lucky, and I, I've, I've been an old soul my whole life. Wow. Yep. You sure sound like it. Gosh. I just think of a blazer I have. But <laughs> <laughs> ninety-six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to, to compare me to clothing. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, what would you say is your best personality trait? Intuition. Uh, for me, by the way, you, you've been forgetting to, to ask me the question. I'm sorry. It's okay. I, had, but I keep thinking afterwards, like, is that right? Is that the right thing to say? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, the ego. The ego still comes in, of course. Um, yeah, so what, what is your best personality trait? Um, I have empathy and I have no filter. Sometimes I've gotten better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and then my favorite question is: there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Oh wow! There is one. Mm hmm uh, There was a um, a fertilizer. Uh huh. That they use the kitchen in Louisiana, and it can actually bring up a gag just talking about it. There's a, there's a fertilizer that they use in the field in, in Louisiana, and they called it Bagash, if you can believe it. That's the name of it. <laughs> so, 
bag ass, okay? Yeah. And it literally smells like sweet vomit. Wow. And so when you're driving by with the, with the uh, windows down, it goes up your nostrils. And it has to be the worst smell ever. It's, it's, to this day, and I haven't smelled that since I was 10 years old. So you gotta, you gotta think how profound an effect it has. Yeah. <laughs> God, I can imagine. Right? Yeah. That's the worst smell you've ever smelled. Uh, either farts or feet. Okay. Either farts or feet. What about feet that smell like farts? <laughs> Never had an opportunity to uh, mix that, so uh, no, I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anybody who has kids, I'm sure they can relate to that the most. I know. You know? I know. Right? I mean, it's just, it goes hand in hand there. So I always uh, end by uh, telling the guest a couple of jokes. Yes, you said you're a comic. Yes. Um, you know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? No. A man rather spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. And on a man, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? What? A liar. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I, that's the first time I'm telling that one, too. I just, I read, I read it on a joke site the other day. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, I like that one. Oh, here's another good one. Um, a, a priest says to his neighbor, Top of the morning to you. I heard the ice bell, the the ice cream bells ringing, and I felt like a kid again. The neighbor says, "Be careful, Father. They have cameras everywhere now." Oh my God! <laughs> that's pretty bad. <laughs> oh, that's awful. It is. It is. <sighs> Well, Krista, I thank you so much for coming on today. You're such a, a, a sweet and insightful lady, and I'm glad that uh, we got to do this and that, uh, you know, we got to wait a while, a while before doing it. Yes, and I appreciate your patience with me. Thank you so much. Ab um, absolutely. You know, I appreciate it. In between losing my mom and moving, um, it's been a bit chaotic, so... Yes, and my condolences um, about your mom, too. How old was she? 78. Oh, that's young still. Yeah, and she had dementia for 10 years, so that was really young. God, it, it's gotten to the point now where, where, where we're starting to lose people, you know, in their 60s and their 70s. Remember back in the day, people used to live to like 100? Yeah, my, my grand, one of my grandmothers did, yep. Yeah, but my grandmother, she was 104, my great-grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So was my great-grandmother, come to think of it. Both of my great-grandmothers, come to think of it, yeah. Yeah, there was something about that generation of, of people who got to live that long, you know. And, and ironically, you know, it wasn't until, you know, the younger generations, you know, uh, people became aware of cholesterol and dieting and all that stuff. It's like, you know, the, the things that people, um, you know, uh, preach about, you know, it's like it, it doesn't work or something. I don't know what it is. Right. Well, I think it's, uh, but they also underestimated the stress. Stress. And, you know, I, I, my, my family, my mom, you know, came from the very repressive uh, 60s. Yep. Uh, yeah, this is the 70s, so they, you know, they were doing a lot of, there was a lot of depression, and of course a lot of, you know, drugs and alcohol, so, yeah. I don't know, maybe that's it. Of course. <laughs> well, Krista, you have yourself a great day, and please stay safe. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. I hope we speak again. I hope we do, too. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Krista Erickson, ain't she a sweetheart? 
Uh, we had some phone issues there, but it went very well. That was a great long interview that I just thoroughly enjoyed. She's such a great, passionate lady, isn't she? Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.